Introduction to Nuclear Technology Chapter 1 Basic Principles This course is intended for people with a wide range of previous experience, or none at all. If the early slides seem too simple, please feel free to skip through until you come to something meatier. Components of an atom We need to start with atomic structure. A description strictly according to modern understanding is too rarefied to be generally comprehensible. It certainly is for me. But for the present purpose, a simple billiard ball type of model will suffice. Any atom comprises two main parts, a nucleus and a surrounding cloud of electrons. The whole atom has a diameter in the region of a hundred millionth of a centimetre and the nucleus occupies a space about 10,000 times smaller in linear dimensions. The nucleus contains from one to a hundred or so protons, each having one unit of positive electric charge and almost exactly one atomic unit of mass. The nucleus also contains neutrons of similar mass but electrically neutral, without which the mutually repelling protons could not hold together. The surrounding electrons each have one unit of negative electric charge, but only about an eighteen hundredth of unit mass. Thus the nucleus provides practically all the mass, and the electrons occupy practically all the volume. Unit masses come at about six followed by twenty-three noughts to the gram and no atom has more than a few hundred of them. So even the smallest speck of matter contains a vast number of atoms. More about atomic components. The atomic nucleus contains at least one proton and except in the very simplest case, hydrogen, a similar or rather larger number of neutrons. In a neutral atom, the numbers of protons and electrons are equal. The interactions between different atoms, in particular their chemistry, are chiefly through the electrons, which may be shared or transferred between them. And so the number of protons, the atomic number, determines the chemical identity of the atom. The periodic table if the elements are listed by atomic number, certain regularities appear in the pattern of physical and chemical behaviour. With the list divided into rows or periods, arranged to fit similar elements into vertical groups, they form the periodic table. The first row contains only two elements, hydrogen and helium. The next two contain eight each and the next two after that, 18 each. After the second of the 18 element rows, an anomaly appears in the next. Element 57, lanthanum, is followed by 14 others with almost identical chemistry, after which the sequence of similarities to the preceding row is resumed. For convenience, the 14, the lanthanides, are conventionally arranged as a separate subperiod below the main table. The next row of the table seems to be reverting to the type of the first two 18 element periods with, for instance, element 92, uranium, the heaviest known until 1940, chemically similar to element 74, tungsten, for historic reasons confusingly given the symbol W. However, when nuclear transmutation in the mid-20th century created successive heavier elements, they were found to form the latter part of another set analogous to the lanthanides, following actinium, and therefore called the actinides. The situation at the start of this subperiod is attributed to a difference in the behaviour of electrons according to which energy level of the two very similar ones available to them they occupy when they are added as the atomic number increases. Isotopes 
For a given element, the number of protons in the nucleus is fixed, but that of neutrons can vary, generally without significant effect on the chemistry, apart from some slight influence due to mass on secondary properties such as the rates rather than the natures of processes. Atoms with different neutron counts for the same atomic number are called isotopes, distinguished by the mass number, the total of protons and neutrons, commonly appended to the name or symbol, as in uranium-238. Hydrogen, with only a single proton forming the nucleus of the most common isotope, is affected to a unique extent by the addition of one or two neutrons, enough for the heavier isotopes to have the individual names deuterium and tritium. The proportion of neutrons to protons can vary only so much before causing instability, ranging from approximate parity in the lightest elements to about 1.6 to 1 in the heaviest. A free neutron is itself unstable, and about as likely as not to break down into a proton and electron in any period of 10 minutes. This tendency is not entirely lost on combination in a nucleus and no element heavier than lead is completely stable. Ejected electrons are a form of radiation, and elements with unstable nuclei are therefore radioactive. Common decay modes Several modes of decay are open to unstable nuclei, all leading to some kind of radiation. For convenience, various types were named arbitrarily with Greek letters before their nature was understood. Elements heavier than lead may emit a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons, as an alpha particle. Emission of an electron as a beta particle may occur in any part of the periodic table, usually, but not always, accompanied by gamma rays. Electromagnetic radiation like light or X-rays, but more energetic. The most extremely heavy elements, effectively only uranium in the natural range, can undergo fission, in which the nucleus splits into two massive parts and a few free neutrons. This may occur spontaneously, but is very much more probable after the impact of a neutron. Internal effects of common nuclear reactions. Emitting an alpha particle reduces the atomic number by 2 and the mass number by 4. Thus uranium-238 becomes thorium-234. This too is unstable and liable to emit a beta particle, raising the atomic number by 1 but leaving the mass number unchanged to give protoactinium 234. Emitting a gamma ray, as often accompanies beta decay, in itself sheds only energy, and so leaves both mass and atomic numbers unchanged. Fission produces two lighter elements in the middle third of the periodic table, though seldom at the center of it, besides some free neutrons. External effects of nuclear radiation Emitted radiation interacts with external matter in ways that are often of medical concern. An alpha particle has very high energy, but interacting strongly with matter has a very short range and can be stopped by a sheet of paper or surface film of moisture while causing concentrated damage to molecules within that range. Beta particles have lower energy, but disperse it more gradually, so have a longer range, about a centimetre in water, but causing more diffuse damage. Gamma rays, being immaterial, interact only weakly with matter and can travel several metres in water. Neutrons, without electric charge, also have a long range, but if absorbed are liable to induce radioactivity in the target material, activation. 
This is of concern because a high dose of radiation in any form to living tissue can have serious adverse effects, especially if delivered rapidly. Whether and how far lower doses may be dangerous is a controversial issue. Low level radiation and its effects. High doses of radiation can undoubtedly cause serious illness or in extreme cases almost immediate death. Clinical effects at lower doses are generally indistinguishable from those due to other often more common causes and so cannot be reliably estimated. It is customary to assume that the risk of, for instance, cancer is directly proportional to the dose received. The linear no threshold LNT hypothesis. This ignores mitigating factors such as the fact that a given dose has a greater effect in a concentrated burst than if spread out over time. There are reasons to suspect that for very low doses in the same region as received by the general population from natural causes may have no ill effect at all or even be beneficial. Nevertheless, the LNT hypothesis is still used in estimating casualty figures in actual or hypothetical incidents because a. there is no evidence to quantify any particular deviation from it and b. otherwise no estimate could be made at all without even more seriously implausible assumptions. Sources of radiation exposure in the UK, half the radiation dose to the general public in aggregate comes from Bradon, a natural gaseous decay product of uranium and thorium, of which traces are widely distributed in rocks, soil and building materials. By far the largest artificial contribution is from diagnostic or therapeutic medical x-rays. However, the diagram represents a national average and regional variations are enormous, with levels particularly high in areas of underlying granite. Such variation does not appear in the medical statistics, where radiation effects could perhaps be outweighed by those of other causes. Nearly all the anxiety about effects on public health concern the tiny proportion represented by industrial discharges which principally affect relatively small sections of the population. Whether the effect in these is significant has been much disputed. Characteristics of nuclear decay The decay of an individual unstable nucleus is purely a matter of chance and cannot be predicted by any known means. However, in any unit of time it has a precise probability so that among the vast number present in any significant quantity of a particular isotope, a definite proportion will disintegrate. In succeeding intervals, the proportion remains the same, but the absolute number declines. Consequently, some always remains, but a half of any quantity will decay in a characteristic time known as the half-life, which may be anything from a fraction of a second to billions of years. The decay patterns of mixtures can therefore appear very complex. Internal effects of neutron absorption. A substance not itself radioactive can often be made so by absorbing a neutron. This is called activation. The tendency to do so varies enormously according to no obvious pattern and the consequences too can vary. One possibility is that after absorption, the resulting nucleus may emit surplus energy as a gamma ray, but suffer no further change. However, instead it may itself emit one or more neutrons. An excess neutron may convert to a proton, emitting a beta particle and usually a gamma ray. It is thus converted to the next higher element in the periodic table. And finally, if it is among the heaviest elements, it may split into two main parts and a few free neutrons. 
fission. Activation as transmutation. Actually, these are the same process, but with different connotations. Activation turns a previously stable substance into one that is radioactive, with a substantial half-life. Whether accidentally, through unintended exposure to a neutron source, or in order to generate a source, for instance for radiography, more convenience than is available naturally. Transmutation turns one chemical element into another, deliberately or incidentally, and the commonly short-lived radioactive intermediate is merely a step towards that end. An example is the conversion of uranium by way of neptunium to plutonium, and then by way of americium to curium. Neutron absorption The probability that a nucleus will absorb a neutron from unit flux in one second is measured in barns, which have the dimensions of area in square centimetres, with one barn the reciprocal of one followed by 24 noughts, and so of the same order as the geometric cross-section area of a nucleus. The density of neutrons in a particular space is inversely proportional to their speed through it, since so is the time that each spends within it. And to that extent, so is the probability of absorption. In another way of looking at it, the lower the speed, the greater the time available for interaction. The speed of a neutron is proportional to the square root of its kinetic energy, e equals half mv squared. At the atomic level, kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, T, on the absolute or Kelvin scale. So although there may be other factors, the underlying trend in the probability of absorption is to follow the square root of 1 over T. Where a nucleus can undergo fission, the probability of its occurrence due to neutron absorption must be combined with that of absorption itself to give an overall fission cross-section. The faster the neutron, the greater the energy available to push the nucleus over the barrier to fission, and so the trend rises above the basic 1 over T line. Moreover, at certain more or less discrete energy levels, there is a greatly enhanced likelihood of absorption, resonance. Thus the overall relationship with temperature becomes quite complicated. More technical terms, I'm afraid. Unfortunately, there is some flexibility and slightly different usages may be found in different places. The energies of nuclear particles are usually given in electron volts or million electron volts. At equilibrium in ordinary temperatures, neutrons have energies of less than one electron volt, about a fortieth at ambient temperature, and are known as thermal. As released by fission, neutrons are fast, with energies in the region of one or two million electron volts, MeV. With energies greater than thermal, but well below the first range, they are known as epithermal. Nuclei that undergo fission in thermal neutrons are fissile, an example being uranium-235, while those that need fast neutrons to cause fission are fissionable, such as uranium-238. Those that are not themselves fissile, but capable of transmutation into fissile products, are fertile, for instance, uranium-238, thorium-232. Since fission releases several free neutrons, each capable of triggering another fission in a susceptible nucleus, a chain reaction can be set up. When exactly one further fission is caused for each that has already occurred, the reaction proceeds at a constant rate. This is criticality and the state required in a power station at steady output. If less than one released neutron per fission goes on to cause another, the reaction dies away until restarted by, for instance, a spontaneous fission. If more than one neutron per fission causes another, 
the train branches and the reaction accelerates until the number is reduced by a circumstance or active intervention to unity or less. This is strictly called supercriticality but in practice is often simply called criticality. Criticality generally requires particularly favourable conditions. In summary, an adequate mass of fissile material configured to limit fruitless escape of released neutrons in a medium that does not absorb too many but preferably slows them down to thermal velocities in time to interact with another fissile nucleus. External materials such as could reflect back escaped neutrons or themselves undergo fission may also be important. Distribution of fission products Fission products occupy the central third of the periodic table, not uniformly, but in a double-peaked distribution. In a thermal system, symmetrical fission, producing two very similar sized main fragments, is about a thousand times less probable than with a mass difference of 30 to 50 units. In a fast neutron flux, the minimum is rather shallower. The instability of fission products. You may remember that the proportion of neutrons to protons in a stable nucleus rises gradually from approximate parity in the lightest elements to about 1.6 to 1 in the heaviest. Consequently, the primary fission products, which are about halfway along the range, each have on average about 10 neutrons too many for stability, but can become stable, or more nearly so, by converting half of them to protons, with increasing atomic number, while emitting electrons as beta particles as they do so. The first few steps are rapid, but the last one or two very much slower, with half-lives of days, years, or anything up to billions of years. The source of energy for all this activity is the light loss of mass that occurs when a heavy nucleus splits according to the Einstein equation E equals mc squared. Much more energy, mass for mass, about six or seven times as much, could be obtained by fusing hydrogen nuclei, single protons. But that is beyond current ambitions because it needs two extreme conditions. Present attempts at nuclear fusion are concentrated on the heavier isotopes deuterium and tritium. For the time being, the nuclear energy industry remains in practice dependent on fission. The nuclear energy cycle. Actual power generation occurs in a reactor, but a great deal of ancillary work is necessary in a complete system. Firstly, the uranium ore must be mined, whether by open cast or underground methods. The ore is commonly poor, with more than 99% as waste, and there is no point in transporting this valueless material, so the uranium is extracted locally in a relatively pure state before shipment as yellow cake. At a fuel plant it is further refined. Then it is usually enriched in fissile content by separating out much of the uranium-238, or sometimes by adding plutonium before manufacture into whatever form of fuel element the destination reactor may take. After discharge from the reactor, it must be stored for a time while the radioactivity of fission products decays to an extent sufficient for manipulation. There is then an option of preparing it for direct disposal or reprocessing it to recover uranium and plutonium for possible future use. Finally, Wastes must be managed in whatever way is chosen to protect the public from harm. 